dwelling in the presence of God is not the most pleasant thing, perhaps, or at least not the kind of thing that we might be very comfortable with. If God were suddenly to appear in our midst this morning, how would you feel about that? Perhaps you might be a little bit nervous. You may recall that when our first parents, Adam and Eve, uh, committed their sin, their relationship with God changed dramatically. Rather than running to meet their Lord, their Creator, they turned and fled. They hid in the trees of the forest, of the, of the garden, so that God would not see them. Suddenly a rift had occurred within the relationship between man and God. And that rift continues with us today. Now, in Christ, that is resolved. We who are redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ have a new relationship with God. We approach Him and cry out, Abba, Father. We delight in God. And in fact, as Paul says, with boldness we enter into the presence of of the Lord through Christ who saved us. And so our relationship with God has changed through faith in Christ and our sense of being in the presence of God has also significantly changed but nonetheless I think we would all be somewhat nervous. You recall the Apostle John, one who ate and drank with the Lord Jesus Christ in the course of his earthly ministry when he uh, had this vision on the Lord's Day of the risen Lord in His glory. You recall that He fell as a dead man before His feet because of the overwhelming glory of the presence of the Lord. Are you ready to live in the presence of God? This morning I want to encourage you to live in this presence, to live in the presence of the Lord of glory, and so be absorbed with that presence that your life is changed and transformed. To use the language of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, he talked about how we are transformed like Moses was on that mount. His face was transfigured when he dwelt in the presence of the Lord up on that mountain. And Paul says that we also are being uh, transformed from glory to glory, even as from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We too experience this marvelous transformation by virtue of our union with God in Christ. We see the glory of God, and that should have an impact on us. And as the glory of God is impressed on your heart and your soul, that will change the way you live. That will change the way you approach life. That will change many things. In the text that we read this morning, Isaiah wants to encourage the people of God who will go through all kinds of unimaginable sufferings. He wants to encourage them to look to the Lord. And to be reminded that He, the Lord, was with them as their helper. As the one who would strengthen them for the days that were before them. And this perspective on life, this understanding that they lived in the presence of God, should fundamentally transform the way they look on their circumstances. It should replace any feelings of pessimism, doubt, and despair, any feelings of fear, shame, or embarrassment should remove all of those things and replace them with boldness, with faith, with, if you will, optimism, proper optimism based on God's Word, based on the Scriptures and God's promises, faith in what God has said. And so Isaiah lifts the eyes of the people of God beyond their present circumstances to the Lord in glory. We began looking at the 41st chapter a couple of weeks ago where we talked about how God brings the nations before Him in a kind of courtroom setting. 
and he engages in a debate with the nations. And he intends to show his people that he is the Lord of all who accomplishes great things through his people. We saw how God would, first of all, how God had done this in the life of Abraham, calling him out from the distant places of the earth to be his own child, to be his servant, to be the chosen one, to bear his name before the nations. And indeed, God accomplished some amazing things in Abraham's life, including the conquering of various kings. God would do the same for his people in the days to come. Though the Babylonians would come and take many of them into exile, God would raise up one named Cyrus. And Cyrus would uh, make a decree that the people of Israel should return back to their homeland and rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. And God would, by naming Cyrus here in just a little bit, show that he indeed was Lord of history. As we saw last week, he's the one who calls one generation after the other. He is with the first and he will be with the last. He is the sovereign Lord of all of human history. He guides and directs it to his own purposes so that his sovereign will will be accomplished in the earth. And so therefore, the exhortation to the people of God is not to be afraid. Though you have enemies before you, enemies all around you, you should not be afraid of them. Well, sometimes that might be easier said than done. We look at the hostility of those who are the enemies of the church, we're rather impressed. We see the inroads that Satan has made in many ways in many uh, apparent churches, those who bear the name of Christian but have really abandoned faith in the scriptures, faith in the Jesus of those scriptures, or in the way of salvation proclaimed in the scriptures. They've gone and merged their understanding of Christian faith with modern philosophies, psychologies, and so forth. And then there are those who are outright opposed to Christianity who uh, would try to do away with any evidence of Christian faith.